Chapter 19 When we walk into the house, my mouth waters at the smell of lasagna. The dining room table is set, and everyone seems to be waiting for us. It hits me that I've been terribly rude to Melanie, walking into their house, bawling my eyes out and taking off for a 45 minutes, when I knew that dinner was nearly ready. I apologize awkwardly, but Melanie assures me that it's fine and she understands. Then she introduces me to her husband and invites us to take our seats at the table. We all get to know each other over dinner. I learn that Hannah is a precocious little girl who has already begun to read. She loves to dance and sing, something we have in common, even if she's twelve years younger than I am. Melanie used to teach elementary school until Hannah got so sick but is now enjoying being a stay-at-home mom, especially, she tells me with a twinkle in her eye, since they just recently found out that they're expecting another child in November. Hannah's dad seems to be a man of few words. He doesn't say very much during dinner, but is clearly very gentle and loving with both Hannah and Melanie. After she's finished, Hannah climbs up into his lap, twines her arms around his neck, and rests her head on his chest. I think of all this family's been through and how wonderful it must be for them to enjoy a normal family dinner without the cloud of a life-threatening illness hanging over their heads. We all agree that it would be nice to go down to the beach before bed. I ask Aunt Susan if I can call Dad first, and of course she agrees. He picks up on the first ring. Hi, Dad. Hi, sweetie. How was your drive? Good. I stop, realizing that it's not true. Long and boring, I correct. Dad chuckles. Yeah, I imagine it was. And you get to turn around and do it again tomorrow, huh? Yeah, but we're going to the beach for a little bit tonight, I say, my tone brightening. Hmm, that sounds nice. Will you bring me back some sand? I smile. Sure, I can do that. I hesitate, seeking the right words for the question I've called to ask. Dad? Yes, honey. I know that the... The facility that Mom's at doesn't allow kids to visit, but do you think they would make an exception if it might help the the patient get better? I stumble over the hard words, the ones that identify my mom as a person who's sick. Well, the information that they gave me did say that they make exceptions occasionally. I take it you got the bead? No, I answer. I think I've got something better. We leave the Leighton's house at 6.30 the next morning. Aunt Susan found a church that offers Mass at 7, so we're headed there before hitting the road. This took me by surprise. My family never goes to Mass on vacation, and I didn't even pack Mass clothes. Of course, the church is filled with old people, all dressed in their Sunday best, and I find myself tugging at the bright blue t-shirt, which isn't quite long enough to cover the gray leggings I'm wearing underneath. Evelyn and Dylan came better prepared, and she gives me an apologetic look as we sit down, smoothing her skirt over her lap. Apparently, they don't do music for the insanely early masses, so mass is quick, and my embarrassment is limited. After mass, Evelyn and I find a park bench outside to wait while Dylan and Aunt Susan talk to the priest and take pictures of the church for some project that Dylan's working on for religion class. Evelyn gives me a doleful look. I'm sorry. I should have warned you. We always go to Mass on Sunday, whether we're in Chicago or Timbuktu. Mom finds a church. It's okay. I should have known, I reassure her. Besides, it was kind of cool. They do exactly the same stuff at this church that we do at home, or at St. Joan of Arc. Yeah, I always used to complain about going to Mass on vacation, but now I sort of like it. Each church is a little bit different, but underneath it all, The mass is the same, and the people are usually really friendly. Evelyn thinks for a moment, then glances sideways at me. You okay with letting Hannah's friend keep the bead, she asks. I shrug, once again putting my fingers down on my own bead. Yeah, I felt a lot better after I took that walk last night. I prayed a rosary and felt really calm and hopeful afterwards. Then your mom and I talked, and she really put it into perspective. Basically, she said that Mom doesn't need the bead. She needs faith, and it's the stories of the beads that will help her find faith again. I bite my lip, wondering now if it can really be that simple. Does that make any sense? I ask Evelyn, 
hoping for validation but fearing that she'll tell me it's crazy. Evelyn thinks for a minute, twisting her hair around her finger and pulling it over her lips as she ponders this idea. Finally, she begins to nod her head. Yeah, yeah, I, that does make sense. She smiles and reaches over for a hug. As we pull back apart, she says, Well, I guess it's too bad that we drove all the way down here for nothing. It wasn't nothing, I respond. I think I needed faith, too. And meeting Hannah and spending time with them, hearing about how she got better for no reason, and that the doctors can't figure it out, I needed to see it for myself before I try and share it with Mom. Seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, I glance back towards the church. Aunt Susan and Dylan are headed our way, finished with their business. We walk together to the car and then settle in for the long trip home. My feet feel like lead as we approach the reception desk. Dad never mentioned that Mom was in a hospital. Somehow calling it a facility made it sound so much nicer, and I wasn't prepared for the sterility that struck me when the automatic doors gave entry to the hospital's stress center. The walls are white, with a few bland pictures scattered about. The furniture is that ugly blue plastic stuff you find at every hospital, and the smell... Well, it's that awful mixture of sterilizer, bodily fluids, and, and goodness only knows what else. The thought of Mom being stuck in this place makes me shudder. We've definitely had our differences lately, but I wouldn't wish this place on my worst enemy. The lady behind the reception desk is friendly, though. When Dad tells her that we're here to see Teresa Roberts and that the doctors have made an exception for my visit, she refers to the computer before smiling and motioning us to sit down. The pleather chairs hold no appeal, so I wander over to a window and look outside, where a few tulips are breaking through the soil. I'm just making bets with myself on what color they're going to be when I hear the doors open, and I turn to see a man dressed, not in hospital scrubs, like I was expecting, but in khaki pants and a navy blue dress shirt. Mr. Roberts, it's good to see you, he says, shaking Dad's hand. And you must be Caitlin, he says turning to me with a friendly smile and warm handshake. I nod my head, avoiding his eyes and looking at his name badge instead. It's hanging backwards, so rather than identifying who he is, I squint to try and read the hospital's mission statement. I'm Dr. Becker. I've been spending a lot of time with your mom, working to help her get home to you as soon as possible, he explains. Oh, nice to meet you, I say, remembering my manners and forcing my gaze up to his. Caitlin, your dad explained that you have something to tell your mom that you believe might help her get better. If you don't mind, I'd like to talk with you about that before we meet with your mom. She's doing really well. We want to make sure, before we introduce anything new, that it won't upset her in any way. Sometimes things that we think will be a benefit can actually end up hurting more than they help. Do you understand? I nod my head again, suddenly feeling even more nervous. Will they keep me from seeing Mom? I've come this far. I don't want to have to wait until she gets home to tell her. And what if they say all these amazing stories are harmful and I shouldn't tell her at all? I panic. Dr. Becker uses his badge to activate the automatic doors, which open onto a hallway with rooms off either side. I'm pleasantly surprised to see that here the walls are painted a warm tan color, and the artwork is a little more colorful. We pass what looks like a living room area where people are playing games, reading magazines, and watching TV. A little more of my horror melts away as I notice the comfortable couches, scattered pillows, and people who actually look completely normal. Finally, he ushers me into an office, complete with a messy desk and shelves lined with books. A picture of him with what must be his wife and two kids sits on one shelf in front of a book that takes a moment to register. The Bible. Then I notice a picture of the Blessed Mother framed on the wall beside the window. Perhaps I've found an ally. Dr. Becker settles into his chair and leans forward with his arms resting on his desk. He clasps his hands and looks at me and says, So, Caitlin, tell me why you're here. I take a deep breath and begin my tale. Twenty minutes later, Dr. Becker leans back in his seat, puts his hands behind his head, and stares up towards the ceiling, 
seemingly lost in thought. After a few moments, he looks at me kindly. When I see the sympathy that's in his eyes, I fear it's all over. His words do nothing to encourage me. Caitlin, it was very brave of you to come here. You must be a very strong young woman. Your mom is in a fragile place right now. She's doing much better and has made significant improvement in the last week. I'm not at liberty to discuss the details with you, but I can tell you this. Your story has the potential to cause your mother to relapse. In fact, I believe that her knowledge of this bead situation triggered the worsening of her condition over the last month or so, which led to her need to stay with us here. Every word is a nail in the coffin of my hope, and my eyes fill with tears. Dad reaches over to squeeze my hand as Dr. Becker continues, his face a blur through the haze of my tears. However, it doesn't sound as though your mom knows the whole story. She only knows that you found your bead and a few others, and that you're working to find still more. She doesn't know about the wonderful things that seem to be associated with these beads. He sits forward leaning on the arm of his chair. This theory that your aunt proposed about your mom's faith and accepting that your grandmother is truly in a better place, well, it does have some merit. I hadn't realized that I was holding my breath until I let it out in a loud exhale. I lean forward. So I can see her? Well, Caitlin, he says slowly, we don't know how your mom will respond. You would need to be prepared for every possibility. Best case scenario, your mom realizes that you're here to help her, listens to your story, and gives it serious consideration. Maybe it would help in her recovery, but it's not going to be an instantaneous reaction, rather one that happens over months or even years. That doesn't sound too bad, Dr. Becker, I say. But that isn't the only possibility, he continues guardedly. In the worst case, your mom could be unable to reconcile the emotions that she has in regards to the whole situation. She could get angry when you tell your story. She could get more depressed. It's impossible to stay. Mr. Roberts, Dr. Becker says, turning towards my dad, it's important for you to understand that this could have a negative impact on your wife and on your daughter as well. If Teresa responds in a negative way, that could be an awful lot for a teenager to deal with emotionally. As your wife's therapist, I'm open to exploring this avenue in the hope that it would be helpful to her. If I were counseling your daughter, however, I might advise against it. He pauses and raises his eyebrows and asks Dad, What are your thoughts on the matter? Two days later, I find myself sitting in a small meeting room at the stress center. Dad and I are seated on one side of the small table that dominates the room. He drums his fingers on his surface while I sit on the edge of my seat, staring at a framed floral print on the wall across from me. Two chairs remain unoccupied, awaiting the arrival of my mom and Dr. Becker. Dad tried to talk me out of doing this. It made me wait two days to make sure that I was really ready for whatever may happen. Bottom line is... I don't feel like I've got much to lose. Plus, I've prayed about it. A lot. And I feel like this is what I need to do. So the, here we are. The door opens, and I feel myself tense, and the sound of Dad's fingers tapping on the table stops. It's been nearly two weeks since I last saw Mom, and months since she showed any affection for me. I'm not sure what to expect, and I'm not sure what to do. So I stay in my seat as Dad rises to give her a hug and a kiss. I watch with interest to see how she'll respond, and I'm reassured to see her hug him back, fiercely. When she comes to stand next to my chair, I rise and give her a half-hearted hug, only to find that she's squeezing me and doesn't seem to want to let me go. Finally, I hug her back, sinking into her warmth and comfort, grateful for this small tenderness that is so long overdue. After several moments, she lets me go and takes the chair beside me. Dr. Becker takes the one remaining chair and looks expectantly at Mom. Kate, she begins, then clears her throat. I've been doing a lot of thinking since I came here, and I realize I owe you an apology. I haven't been much of a mother to you in the last year or so. 
And for that, I'm very sorry. It's just, I don't want to hear her excuses or explanations and hold up my hand to stop her. Mom, it's okay. I'm fine. I lie. I'm here because, I search for the words, and finding none that seems suitable, I blurt out, I'm here because Grandma sent me. Mom jerks back, her face showing total surprise, before a shudder comes down over it and there's no emotion whatsoever. Dad coughs beside me, clearly shocked that I would come right out and say it like that. Dr. Becker leans forward, ready to come to the rescue, but I rush on before he can get a word out. Well, she did, I say, looking defiantly at the doctor and my dad. But before you blow this off and decide not to listen to a word I say, let me start at the beginning. Taking a deep breath, I begin. It feels like I've told the story a million times now, finding my bead on the day of Grandma's memorial, meeting Chelsea and her friend Emma, the story of Emma's accident and how she was miraculously uninjured, then talking to Roger Billings and learning about Hannah and her amazing recovery. I tell her about Beth and her brother James and the vision that he had that led to him overcoming his addiction. I tell her about our trip down to Florida to get her bead back from little Hannah. All the while, Mom sits back in her chair, arms crossed over her chest, as though she doesn't believe it or doesn't care. But I plow on, praying as I speak whenever I pause. Blessed Mother, Grandma, please help me. I know that without them, I'll never finish the story. Somehow, I manage to ignore Mom's look of indifference and pretend that I'm talking to someone who cares. Mom, you should have seen little Hannah. She's the cutest little thing, and she's so healthy. You'd never guess that she'd ever been sick. And get this, she said that a woman was with her in the hospital. Whenever her mom and dad couldn't be there. Mom, I lean forward. She called the woman the Blessed Mother. I wait for my words to sink in before adding. And she's not even Catholic. Mom's jaw tightens and her gaze jumps away from mine. She glares resolutely at the same floral print that I'd stared at earlier. My resolve begins to crack. Should I even keep going? I don't seem to be getting anywhere. The progress I thought we'd made when she hugged me all seems lost. We're right back to where we started several weeks ago. I say another prayer and I keep going. Our whole reason for going down there was to get your bead. I thought, I thought maybe it would help you. Mom chews on her bottom lip. I wait a moment, thinking she might say something, but she doesn't. So I continue. But Hannah gave your bead to her friend Tara at the hospital, who was really sick and going to have surgery on Monday. She thought it might help her. My heart races as I search for the words to share the latest news, which is so incredible, so unbelievable, so miraculous. There was a bunch of medical lingo that I didn't understand, and I look at Dad for my eyes pleading with him to take over for me. Dad reads my cue and jumps in, leaning on the table to get Mom's attention. She finally stops glaring at the flower on the wall and looks at him. Teresa, Hannah's mom, called yesterday, as soon as she got the news. Tara's surgery was to remove a brain tumor. All the tests beforehand showed that it was wrapped around her brain stem, and the doctors were sure that they wouldn't be able to get all of it. They had hoped to get most of it, and then be able to treat the rest with chemo and radiation. Apparently, there was a very good chance that she might not even make it through the surgery. Dad clears his throat and continues, Teresa, you know I'm the least likely person to believe in this stuff, but... He glances between me and the doctor and then back at Mom. This is amazing, Teresa. It just can't be a coincidence. When they went in, the tumor had shrunk down to almost nothing, and they were able to get all of it. The doctors were stunned. There's no explanation, they say. The doctors say it's a miracle. The little girl, Tara, when she woke up afterward, she asked for the lady in blue, the one that held her hand and loved her so much. No one speaks. I listen to the soft ticking of the clock on the wall, and hear the sound of someone walking down the hall outside the closed door. Mom shifts her eyes away from Dad and looks instead at the hands clenched tightly in her lap. A tear splashes onto her thumb. Mom, I say quietly, I think all of this is happening because Grandma prayed so. 
so many times on each of those beads. I know it sounds crazy, but I think Grandma's prayers are being answered with these miracles. But I think there's something else, another reason. Mom, I think it's because she prayed for you. I think she wants you to know that she's okay, that she's in a better place. I gulp, wishing I hadn't used that cliche, but knowing that it's true. I think she wants you to believe. I finish, and sit back in my seat, as once again the silence fills the room. I sit there, waiting for Mom to respond, waiting for her to say something, anything. But she doesn't. She just pushes back her chair, opens the door, and walks out of the room. It's been three long days. Days spent beating myself up, wishing I hadn't gone, that I hadn't said anything to Mom. Clearly, it didn't help a bit, and maybe it only made things worse. I wonder if I'll ever have a real Mom again, or if I'll be stuck for the rest of my life with this shell of a woman. Tomorrow is Easter Sunday. Aunt Mary Ellen picked me and Gwen up on Thursday to shop for Easter dresses and new shoes. The family celebration is planned for Aunt Susan's house, but I don't feel much like celebrating. Aunt Liz is in town. Evelyn and I gave her her bead this morning over breakfast. She cried and hugged both of us and listened to Evelyn share the stories of all the miracles that happened. I couldn't bring myself to add anything more than the occasional weak smile. It was good to see Aunt Liz so happy. It only made me more angry that my own mom doesn't seem to believe the stories. Around noon, I'm eating yet another peanut butter and jelly sandwich when the phone rings. Gwen picks it up, then yells down the stairs, Kate, it's for you. Hello, I say, putting the phone to my ear. Hi, Kate, it's Aunt Mary Ellen. I just visited your mom. She wants to see you and asked me to bring you this afternoon. The doctor's already said it's okay. My heart begins to race, and my hands suddenly get clammy. What does she want? I ask, afraid to hope that it's good news. She didn't say, sweetie, but she's doing much better today. There's a sparkle in her eyes that I haven't seen in ages. She smiled, Kate, really smiled, and she asked how you and Paul and Gwen are doing. I think what you told her helped. I think it must have. She pauses, then asks, Can I come pick you up now? She seemed really anxious to see you. I look down at my sweatpants and t-shirt and run a hand through hair that I haven't washed in three days. Not really how I want to present myself to this new mom that Aunt Mary Ellen says has emerged. Nevertheless, if she's really doing better, and if she wants to see me... Yeah, how soon will you be here? Ten minutes. I hang up the phone and run upstairs to change into something more presentable. Something Mom would like. I find a blue skirt and white quarter sleeve shirt, and after inspection shows that they're not too terribly wrinkly, I throw them on. I scrub my teeth, and I'm still pulling the brush through my tangled hair when I hear Aunt Mary Ellen calling from the kitchen. Kate, are you ready? With one final yank of the hairbrush, I trip down the stairs and arrive, huffing a bit, in front of my aunt. I find Dad in the den to let him know where I am going, ignoring his look of shock when he hears the news. I realize I am forgetting something and race back up to my room. I grab the painting that Hannah had given me, tuck it into a folder to protect it, and cram the folder into my backpack. Finally, Aunt Mary Ellen and I are in the car, headed back to the stress center. A friendly woman leads me to the same room where Dad and I met with Mom and Dr. Becker before. This time, they're already in there, waiting. Kate, I'm so glad you could come. Mom stands relieved as she stands and gives me a hug. This time, it's quick and unsure, and I feel my hands grow clammy again, wondering where all this is headed. Mom sits down in her chair and waits for me to sit before she begins. Kate, I told you last time you were here that I'm sorry, and I mean it. I am sorry. More than you can know. There's no excuse for how badly I've treated you this past year. But what I want you to understand is why. Where I've been coming from, even though I know I've been terribly wrong and there's really no excuse. Mom takes a sip from the cup of water that's sitting on the table 
and then takes a deep breath before beginning. I don't know how to describe all the feelings I went through when mom died. I loved her so much. Yet, in the last ten years, well, I hadn't been much of a daughter for her. When dad died, I was angry with her because she seemed so okay with it. Oh, sure, she clearly missed him, but she would smile serenely and say how glad she was that he was out of pain and that she trusted that he would be in heaven when she got there. I thought it was just so stupid, so ridiculous. I wanted dad back, and it made me mad when she said that wanting to keep him here when he was in so much pain from the cancer was selfish. So I spent most of those last two years being angry with mom and really wanting nothing to do with her. She was all wrapped up in her faith, always praying, always saying that Christ brought her through dad's illness and death and that he would bring her through anything she faced. I just didn't get it, and it just made me more and more angry. I wanted to try to get over being so mad at her, and the day before she left on the trip, I asked her to have breakfast with me. But she said that she couldn't. Her rosary group was meeting to pray for someone, and that they were having breakfast afterward. I felt hurt and got even more angry with her. I told her how stupid I thought she was for wasting so much time praying that ridiculous prayer. I told her that all of her prayers hadn't done a thing to help Dad, and that it wouldn't help the person that she was praying for, and that it was just a way for a bunch of old ladies to feel like that they were doing something productive, when in fact they were just wasting time. Mom closes her eyes, pain etched across her face. The next day, she left for her trip, and there was the accident, and I never saw her again. Those were my last words to her. Mom, you're just wasting your time. You could do so much, and you could make such a difference, but instead you spent hours praying that ridiculous rosary. You're a fool. My mom looked up from the water that she'd been staring into, straight into my eyes. I actually said those words. You're a fool. She shakes her head and looks down into her cup. You've always reminded me of her. You've got her eyes, her mouth. I think your voice sounds like hers. And sometimes when I hear you on the phone, I think for a moment, it's mom. She looks at me again. That's why I've been so distant from you this year. I just couldn't bear it. You made me think of her, and I couldn't stand to think about her and the way that I treated her. Your presence felt like a judgment against me. Then you found that bead. She shakes her head and looks off into the corner. And that was the last straw. It brought everything rushing back, and I just couldn't deal with it. I wanted you to lay off the whole subject, to bury that bead and forget that it ever existed. But no, you didn't do that. You went looking for more. She gives me a bitter chuckle. You had to go looking for more. There's a crucifix that hangs in my room here. At first, I couldn't stand having it there. It was like Jesus was looking down at me, telling me what a terrible person I was for being so cruel to my mom and to my own daughter. After you came on Wednesday, though, it changed. Suddenly, I started to remember things that I learned in school. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus' words from the cross kept coming back to me, and I realized that he forgives me, and that he wants me to forgive myself. I thought about what you said, and I realized that Mom forgives me too, and that she wants me to be happy. Tears are streaming down her face now, and mine too. Mom continues, I never stopped believing you now. I believed in Jesus. I just didn't really want it to go any further than that. I didn't want to change my life or my ways because of him. That's what bugged me so much about mom. Everything she was, was all about Jesus. I just didn't get it. And I'm still not sure that I do. But it's starting to make sense. And I know you're right, Kate. I know that mom is in a better place. And it's just like her to keep praying. Praying for people in need and praying to give me a gentle nudge to get back into line, to get me to believe what she's been trying to show me all along. Jesus is real. Mary is real. It's all real, and it's there for the taking. 
if only we open ourselves up to it. Mom leans forward and grabs my hands where they lie on the table. Thank you, Kate, she says emphatically. Thank you for telling me all those wonderful and miraculous stories. I feel so much better. I feel so much more hope. I feel like I can accept your grandma's death, and grandpa's too. I know mom was right with all she said when dad died. I have to laugh about her up there orchestrating all of these things. She gives me a watery smile, and I find myself rising from my chair to give her a hug. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in her lap, even though I'm way too old to sit in my mom's lap anymore. But it feels so right, and we're hugging and crying and laughing and reveling in this new us. A long time later, we leave the room together. Dr. Becker asks a nurse to accompany us, and Mom and I walk hand in hand to the waiting room. Before reaching the automatic doors, I remember Hannah's picture in my backpack. Pulling it out, I hand it to Mom. Hannah, the little girl in Florida, painted this for me. It's a picture of her and her friend Tara, with me and the Blessed Mother. I thought it might be something nice for you to have in your room. Next, I reach behind my neck and unclasp the chain, and then drop the bead into my palm. And, I say, holding the small treasure out to her, I want you to have this, at least until you come home. Mom cradles the bead in her hand and gives me a smile, tears once again welling in her eyes. Clasping me in another hug, she whispers, Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Turning back towards the waiting room doors, I notice the nurse is staring at us, with her mouth gaping open. Where did you get that? she asks, pointing to the bead. It was my grandmother's, I answer. My my niece found a bead just, just like that, the woman stammers. Looking at me with wide eyes, she adds, You won't believe what happened.